Hi, welcome to Daily Watch Talks 150, and now rightfully so. And this is a special one because Christian and I have uh, looked very much forward to the occasion of discussing Parmigiani. What a great watch brand that is. And that's what we're going it's to do It's always today. been, since 1996, of course, with Michel Parmigiani, a master restorer of great watches um, when he started the company. It's a family-owned company. It's a family-owned company. But the funny thing is, and Nick and I, we've discussed this beforehand, you know, the problem with, I think that the main problem of Parmigiani was not too many people cared enough. They didn't hate it. They didn't love it. So when you, when you float around in the middle, you become not obsolete, of course not, but That's, become a little boring. It's like the, the, um, the Gégé Le Coutre dilemma. Loved by everyone, but not really top of mind. I think it was even worse with the Parmigiani. But let's stick to what we're going to do is we're going to discuss Parmigiani and we assume that you know the brand, but maybe not all the details. So we dive a little bit into the origins to understand and to try to understand where Parmigiani stands for. And then we move quickly to where Parmigiani is today, because that's the good part. Yeah. The last two years are quite exciting. Very much indeed so, and because of a, a young gentleman named Guido. Exactly. We'll get to that. Parmigiani starts unofficially in, uh, in 1976, because Parmigiani Nin is not only a brand. 1996. No, I'm going back to when Michel started as a watchmaker. As a watchmaker. <laughs> ah, sorry, yeah. I thought it was the brand. No, we have the brand and the okay. person and yeah. the founder of Parmigiani is Michel Parmigiani. He started in 1976 as a master watchmaker, specializing in restoring complicated vintage clocks. And uh, I think that I once read that everybody makes 10 good decisions in life that really forms who you are and where you go. One of the decisions and one of the occasions that Parmigiani took was in 1980 when he was assigned to restore the collection of the Sandow family. Sandow's foundation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. That, that was 1980 and fast forward to 96. That, that was actually the result of that encounter and that assignment was that in 96, with the help of the Sandow foundation, Sandow, yeah. uh, Parmigiani, the brand, was founded. Yeah. Michel Parmigiani himself is very fond of balloons. Oh. And I think uh, what, yeah. what is really interesting is that when we talk about watchmakers, we think that's, that's what they do. They do watches. But of course, you know, they get up extremely early in the morning, so they leave early afternoon. Whereas, you know, we get in at 9 and leave at 5. They get in around 5.30 and they leave around 2.30 or 3. So you need to have a passion for something else than watches when you go back home to your house. Michel Parmigiani loved Hot air balloons. <laughs> he loves hot air balloons. Okay, okay. I, I remember that. It's they're also sponsoring some events related to that. Comes to mind, but I yeah. don't have the details on that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but with uh, the backing of Sando, of course, you can start dreaming a bit bigger than just being a watchmaker, and that's what Parmigiani did because the brand developed, and we were there uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. We were visiting not only the Parmigiani uh, headquarters, but we also visited Vaucher, the movement maker. And there we were, we were confronted with a beautiful plate, a beautiful screen, where actually the whole Parmigiani empire was stated. And yeah, that was that, a nice timeline. Yeah, that's quite impressive. They are also having stakes or owning or uh, being part of uh, 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 Ato Calpa, a hairspring maker, Elwin, screws, Les Artisans Vaucher, a case maker. Uh, Quadran Abilage, the, the, the dial maker, mm. and of course Vaugier. Yeah. So if you put it in perspective, what, what, was, uh, what happened between 96 and now is a whole empire of high-end watchmaking. Absolutely. And we also years. saw that with, uh, with the watches actually, or well, the movements being produced, the Vaugier, yeah. for other extremely high-end watch brands. And it was not until recently that these brands actually allowed Vaugier to advertise the watches on the wall. Yeah. Before that, you couldn't show the movements you made for other brands. Now, I believe the, the other brands are so proud yeah. of having the, some of the movements produced by Vaucher that you're allowed to advertising within the manufacturer. Yeah, we were still a bit limited, right? In, uh, we couldn't 
we couldn't touch everything there. But that's, no, uh, we couldn't take a lot of pictures. Yeah, so uh, uh, Parmigiani, if, if, how do you position Parmigiani right now? What, well, Parmigiani is a niche brand. Uh, it's a family-owned brand. It's an independent brand. It's in Florier. The other uh, great brand uh, in Florier is Chopin. Yep. Chopin has invested a lot in, in Florier. Uh, they restored the clock tower uh, in, the, in, the, in the quaint town. It takes quite a while to drive there. I believe we, we spent uh, a little shy of an hour driving uh, from Neuchâtel by car to Florier. Beautiful uh, little town. And they have their own uh, precision certification, if you like, uh, the Fleurier Quality Foundation. I believe Chopin also has taken advantage of that. Uh, and that is quality control in a much higher level than we are used to uh, within other certifications, if you like. Today, with Guido at the helm of Parmigiani, it's still very much Parmigiani. It's still very much uh, 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 Vosche movements. Of course it is, because the movements made, produced by the Vosche manufacturer are of extremely beautiful quality. Also, the dials, uh, the Guilloche dials of, uh, well, of course, the, the, the most recent Tonda PEF collection are gorgeous, absolutely stunning. The integrated bracelets are not just integrated bracelets. They're made of different parts to make the integration perfect with the, with the middle case, if you like. Micro rotors. We love micro rotors because Definitely. it makes sure you are, you are watch the possibility to make it extremely flat. Um, and I think especially when we look at what, uh, what Guido introduced in, um, already in 21. Yeah. He told us he spent seven months. It doesn't sound like much. Because when you look at the, the Tonda PF um, and the Tonda PF, the, the GMT Rattrapant especially, you look at two incredibly handsome watches. And I think there's a mechanical purity to the new collection of the Tonda PF. Uh, of course, in steel and of course in, in gold and with platinum bezels, which is, uh, which is you know, recognizes a Parmigiani watch. Yep. Yep. So I saw them during Watches and Wonders and I saw Guido standing outside. He didn't know me by then. I just went over to him and I shook his hand. I, I, I congratulated him on the beauty of the watches. Yeah. We didn't work with them at all. But I was just, you know, when you walk around Watches and Wonders and if we go back to SIJ's, the watch fair, I would be yawning, and this is honest, I would be yawning and, and sometimes skipping the Parmigiani presentation. I apologize to Michel Parmigiani, but it was not the, the happiest moments of a watch fair, admittedly. But that's my fault because I simply did not understand the brand. Now visiting uh, uh, the, the, the HQ and the Vosche move, uh, movement manufacturer for the first time was an eye-opening experience. As we talked about just before, you know, Parmigiani has been here since 1996. They've come out with a plethora of great watches, the Bugatti, three generations of the Bugatti. Um, you had the 370 and then you had the, the, the later type, the 390. Uh, you know, I only recalled one of them, the first edition of the Bugatti, but he continued to make the Bugatti watch. He did. And whereas today, it's no longer to be found in the production. It's but that was an impressive and benchmarking watch back then, 2005. It's, it's the same with the Toric, which is a classic, uh, uh, a Parmigiani classic already from the late 90s. What, what you... What you're saying, and, and, and that triggers me, I think that, that, that you're right. You, 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 you tend to pass Parmigiani at, at previous fairs, although we know what the quality is. So what we see here, if we see at the impressive track record of the brand, there was one thing missing that Guido added, and that is the, 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 the beautiful look, the great look. It works. It's actually... The, the final, uh, 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 how do you cook, the icing on the cake, if you will, because the quality was already there. The understated sartorial positioning was already there, but the watches were just off beat, maybe. I think, now it, I it think works. It's, I think it's way more than icing on the cake. I think it's a different kind of cake. Um, because if, you, if we discuss one of the absolutely the main attractions from Parmigiana this year, actually last year, but we saw them this year at Watches and Wonders, is the GMT Rattrapant. 
Rest apparent, of course, it means that you can uh, press on a button and the rest apparent hand is hidden behind the central hand. So it's when the GMT is running, it's a three hand watch. If not, it's a two hand watch. So when you travel, you have your hometown time and your local time. So I sat with uh, Guido in, uh, in Fluye and I asked him, why don't you have an AM PM indicator on the watch? And, you know, with his, his smile, he's a good looking man. And he said to me, you know, I know if I'm traveling east or west, I know that. And I almost told him, I don't know that. I, I, I don't have a clue. But then again, that's, that's the mechanical purity that he's introducing to a somewhat complicated watch, which you would usually see with an AM, PM indicator or date or more functions. See, the only complication that the Tonda PF GMT Razzapant has is a GMT and somewhat a Razzapant. Yeah, yeah. Gorgeous piece. Gorgeous pieces. And um, I, was, I was in preparing this and in investigating uh, and, and, and studying Parmigiani, I was asking myself uh, what I asked you already, where do we place Parmigiani in horology? Because on the one hand, it reminds me of, of classic high-end watches like a Lange, uh, a Breguet, if you will. The respect for traditional watchmaking, everything to the highest standards. But it also has this more Italian contemporary look. So it's not, it, 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 it bridges maybe a brand like Breguet with a more contemporary high-end watch brand somehow. I, I disagree in terms of the Lange. Okay. Because the Lange is not quintessential. You know, you have 423 parts. Yeah. So when you turn a Lange around, yeah. you dive into a city of movement components. Yeah. You don't do that with a Parmigiani. You look at an extremely beautifully decorated and also a quintessential of of uh, horology in yeah. the movement. Yeah. I think there's more of an elegance. And I think that, that, you know, there's a... I think, you know, this is my opinion. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, opinion yeah. only. That if I should, should talk about what a, a, uh, an owner of uh, the new Tonda collection would yeah. look like, you know, it would be a, a savvy, cultivated Italian gentleman yeah. in a beautiful, restorated... Uh, uh, open sports car of the 60s or 70s. A sartorial uh, a suit or jacket, tailor-made. Yeah, but you know... Finest fabric. Savvy, cultivated, educated. Uh, it sounds elite. I don't talk about this gentleman may be elite. But when I say cultivated, then I'm thinking about uh, he's knowledgeable into horology. He's been through his big three yeah. If you like. Yeah. He's been through that. He's been there. Yeah. He probably started collecting when he was 16 because his father and his grandfathers, they were also collectors. So he knows horology. And I think I had a problem once with, with uh, I had a um, Lang und Schöne Perpetual Calendar chronograph. And um, at some point when I was working in the auction business, I had a 5970 in my home because it had to go to service. And I, I compared the two of them. If I turned it around, I fell in love instantly with the Lange. But when you look at the dial of the, the, the Patek Philippe 5970, you can see every single compilation. I didn't need a magnifying glass, whereas the Lange, is eh, kind of difficult to see what time it was. I think even, you know, when you go into the mechanical purity of the movement, as well as these Barney Korn, Giyoshi, beautiful uh, 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 dials of, of the Tonda PFs, you have what you need yeah. and nothing else. Yeah. The rest, you have to think yourself. You have to think yourself. Yeah, it's not everything on automatic. I and I like that's the lack of the AMPM because then I, I, I told Guido, you know, why don't you just put it on the back of the watch? Because like, you don't have, you should never take your watch off to tell a function or a complication, if you like. And he has a great answer for everything. He is, yeah. he is himself the savvy, cultivated, educated guy. He drives an older generation Range Rover, and he has dog biscuits in the little uh, 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 compartment of the passenger door. He's actually his own archetype customer. 
That's exactly what I'm saying. But it, I like what you're saying. And I think w when, when, you, when you visit the Parmigiani website, there is a section called Stories with beautiful articles, not necessarily aimed at reviewing the watch or, or showing the watch, but showing the life and the, and the universe of Parmigiani. At least that's what they try to do. One of the articles is called If You Know, You Know. By Alexander Friedman. By Alexander Friedman. That Good very point. much catches the essence of Parmigiani. And the other one, a purest delight for those in the know. Mm. And that's actually in the same direction. You don't have to flaunt or show off what you have on your wrist because you know it yourself. Yeah. And you've been, you have earned your way into Parmigiani. You had your fair share of beautiful watches in other segments, in other price ranges. And at some point you treat yourself with a Parmigiani because you know. I like yeah, that. No, no. Yeah, well, the thing, you know, the, the, if you are a niche brand like Parmigiani, you need to be precise and uncompromising in your design and your quality. Yeah, yeah. And I think the dilemma for Guido is there's so many things you have to take into consideration that you can't start thinking about a plethora of complications uh, apertures on your dial. Yeah. Of course, with the chronograph, it's different. Yeah. But I think that the, the, um, the simplicity and the purity of the GMT Ratzapant is a great ambassador of Guido's thinking uh, and consideration of modern horology with a classical twist. Mind you, he came from Bulgari. He was at the helm of uh, Bulgari, um, and during his time, they won no less than 57 watchmaking awards. 57. That's impressive. See, he's already nominated for, for Watch of the Year at the uh, Geneva yeah. uh, Grand Prix uh, for two of the pieces. Uh, we've seen the novelties that will be introduced now on October 1st, uh, which are great. There's a 36 millimeter of the PF. Yeah. Um, and uh, during an interview, uh, we sat with, with Guido and uh, he said, you know, he was wearing the, the 40 millimeter uh, micro rotor, which is a gorgeous, absolute perfect watch. Stunning piece. Uh, and when we were there, the GMT was not in the house because it's so popular, it's, it's so high demand, they didn't even have a prototype left. Uh, not that they sell the prototypes, but he was on a world tour. Um, and it was funny trying on the 36 millimeter. I know that we are in a non-gender specific trend these days. But also, I think the older we get, this is a personal perspective, it matters if it looks good on me. I don't care what you think when you look at my wrist. But when I looked at my wrist with the 36 millimeter ton of PF on my wrist, I thought it looked stunning. Absolutely stunning. All right, Parmigiani today, yeah. 2022. Uh, if you look at the website and if you visit Parmigiani, it comprises basically of three collections. The Tonda GT, the Chronograph, which was just before Guido took over, launched. We have some Toric pieces and we have the PF range that we have discussed yeah. extensively, which yeah. is basically the new dawn, the new look yeah. of Parmigiani. Um, where are we, Christian, when it comes to, to, to the market with Parmigiani? What are we looking at in terms of numbers? Well, I think they were super, uh, super honest with us. Pascal, Pascal Brandt is, is working uh, very close to, to Guido. Uh, Pascal I met when he was working with uh, Panerai. Yeah. And then he was with, uh, with Vachon Constantin. And uh, most recently before uh, he was with Bulgari, which of course Guido was also. So they were probably, you know, they, they, they were tight and, and uh, Guido took him from uh, Bulgari with him to Parmigiani. Pascal is a super experienced, laid back fella, very likable, very knowledgeable. And he said, Christian, um, you know, before Guido took over, uh, the annual production of Parmigiani was a little shy of 2000 pieces. See, I didn't know if I would say, oh, that's a lot or wow, that's very little because I had no idea. No. 2,000 pieces on an annual basis could be pretty good for a lot of brands. If you look at uh, Max Busser and Friends, Uwerwerk, uh, Zappe, well, Zappe not so much because he's going to increase to almost 5,000 pieces a year. Yeah, but they're still not there yet. No, no, no. But there, I think 2,000 is probably most comparable to Moser right now. There may be 1,500, something like that. that could be, yeah. That, that's that magnitude. Yeah. But... So, <laughs> Right now, they have enough orders 
to produce eight to nine thousand pieces a year. Can you imagine that? You're going from a little shy of two thousand, and you just go to eight nine. Problem is the bottleneck again. Yeah. And Parmesan is not the only Swiss watch brand that is in strong need of the most vital things of a watch: central hands and winding crowns. Yeah. You can if do. If you don't have that, you don't have a watch. You can have a beautiful movement and a great dial and a great middle case, but you can't wind and you can't tell the time. Imagine if you, even if you have like Parmigiani, a lot in house, yeah. you still have the bottlenecks. Absolutely. And the bottleneck is, is a nasty tendency in watchmaking these days. We may have a crisis, a economic and infl in, in, in inflation, of course, not in Switzerland, by the way. Switzerland just, they don't do inflations at all. Uh, but they do bottlenecks, and they do bottlenecks a lot, uh, and uh, other brands are simply missing out on their full production because the most vital parts, both visually but also mechanically, are in great demand. Yeah. So 8,000, so that means that is, uh, uh, apart from, from the, 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 the supply chain and the mm. challenges you have there, mm. if this continues for Parmigiani, it also implies that the company will grow to new dynamics. If you go from 2,000, if you fourfold your production, then you are a serious player. Well, I think my dilemma, if I was Wurge, yeah, and I produce movements, for so many other brands, yeah. I might have to go to them and go like, sorry, you know, we, we have to do half of what we're used to because now we, we need these for Parmigiani. Yeah. See, I, I don't think it's going to be like that, but people ask me, Christian, why, why, why are Rolex not producing 4 million watches? I'm like, well, you know, Switzerland is a tiny country. You can't train everybody to be watch assemblers and you can't just build new manufacturers in the middle of the mountains. You know, there's also a ice hockey hall that needs to be built right there. So Switzerland is not all about watchmaking, but since the tendency of loving horology is increasing strong yeah. and the middle class is growing as well, that creates a bottleneck. We'll so, see. <clears throat> very, very interesting times for Parmigiani. I have become a huge fan of Parmigiani. I've always known Parmigiani was present. Uh, but if I would pass a retailer with Parmigiani watches, I would either look at the watches and think, good luck, or I would just pass it unnoticed. Today, not so much, as in not at all. I would probably bump into the store, try the watches on, want to buy it, and of course I can't afford it, but the retailer would smile at me like I asked for a Rolex Daytona and go like, sorry sir, computer says now. Nah. Yeah, well, bottleneck problems. Then I would like to have a Tonda PF. So, sir, we have the same issue here. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. No, but I agree with you. For me, uh, 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 Parmigiani is definitely on the radar, much more than before. And, and you know why it's also on the radar? No. Because they produce or produced a watch fit for a king. True. And that's a, that's a great thing to, to start with. Last week, you might remember, we had our discussion about the king's watches. And uh, one of the kings, actually the new king we have in the world, King Charles, he is uh, an voluntary, unofficial ambassador of Parmigiani. Imagine that, King Charles being an influencer. Yeah. Take that. So he had historic uh, uh, um, at the funeral of his beloved mom, and he is wearing it already for more than 20 years. So he has good taste in watches. The funny thing is, again, we probably noticed that he had it, but didn't notice because it was a, you know, old school Parmigiani. But now we know. Yeah. Now we do notice. And that's, the, that's exactly, precisely what's happening with Parmigiani now. If you know, you know. We are taking notice of this wonderful Fleurier watch manufacturer. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much. Um, I have one thing that we need to discuss in the next few uh, uh, podcasts. And that is, uh, we're going to do uh, nice stuff with Carl F. Mohorak. Great I brand. have to mention that great we can't brand. reveal anything yet, but uh, stay tuned. That's a great thing coming from them. Be good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.